Chapter 24 is the story of the trial in front of Felix. The first trial is Felix. The second trial is Festus. The third trial is Herod Agrippa. Then there's the appeal to Caesar and the trip to Rome. This is how the book of Acts ends with these successive trials and then the journey to Rome for the final trial. Um, well, in Caesarea, they wait for the prosecutor to come, the prosecution team to come. They wait for the lawyer who's going to come and say, Paul needs to die. They wait for the witnesses to come down and say, here's the reason why he needs to die. This is what a bad guy he is. This is the bad these are the bad things he's done. Amazingly, Luke tells us the name of the lawyer for the prosecution. His name was Tertullius. So this lawyer with a Roman name, he may have been a, a Hellenistic Jew, an ethnic Jew with a Roman name or a Greek name. Tertullus, he begins to accuse Paul to the governor, to Felix in chapter 24. Now, again, his first accusations are simply vague. He's a pest. He stirs up trouble. He's a leader of the, the sect, the cult of the Nazarenes. But then by the time he gets to verse 6, Acts 24, 6, he says something very specific. He even tried to desecrate the temple. That is, he tried to damage the temple or do vandalism to the temple. Now, that was a lie. Paul didn't try to do that at all. He never tried to do that. He never had any intention of doing that. And yet, uh, they have witnesses who come forward and who claim that that indeed did happen. I don't know if you've ever heard a really good lawyer in a court case. But a really good lawyer can make an innocent man feel, uh, sound guilty. A really bad lawyer can make an innocent, can, uh, can make uh, his client sound guilty even if he's innocent. I mean, a, a good lawyer, a bad lawyer can make a big difference in a case. Um, this man complains about the violence with which the Roman commander stopped them from trying to kill Paul. It's amazing the irony in his speech. He says in verse 6, we wanted to judge Paul according to our own law, but Lysias, the commander, came along and with much violence took him out of our hands. The Roman commander was violent to us. He took the prisoner out of our hands. Well, what was happening to the prisoner in their hands. They were beating him. They were trying to kill him. So the lawyer calls attention to the violence of the Roman commander who was rescuing the man that they were being violent to. You know, um, a testimony can be very, very selective. Emphasize one point, leave out another point, so that what's taking place is deception. What's taking place is a lie. He's lying. He's not only lying about what Paul did or what Paul didn't do, he's lying about what the Roman commander did while completely excusing the people who were trying to commit murder. Um, the Jewish accusers who had come down from Jerusalem in verse 9, they backed up the, the testimony of the lawyer and they said that, that he was telling the truth. So in verse 10, Paul begins to make his defense. And basically he says, I was just being a worshiper in Jerusalem. I wasn't trying to carry on a discussion. Verse 12, I wasn't trying to start a riot. And they can't prove anything that they have, have said about me. He said, but one thing they said about me is true. I do serve this way which they call a sect. I am a servant of Jesus of Nazareth, but I serve the God of my fathers according to the law and what's written in the prophets. In other words, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets. 
There's no contradiction in following Jesus and fulfilling the law and, and the prophets. And then he appeals again to the doctrine of the, the resurrection, the general doctrine of the resurrection of all people. And then in verse 21, he appeals to the truth of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Now, Felix the, the judge does four things. He does four bad things. The first thing he does is he makes a promise that he doesn't keep. He says, when, when Lysias the commander comes down here, then I'll decide on your case. The second thing, uh, so, so, so he procrastinates. He puts off doing what he needed to do. The second thing is he breaks a promise. It, it never really happens with Lysias the commander. But a few days later, his wife shows up, and his wife is a Jew. And either he or she thought it might be an amusing thing to do to, to listen to Paul or to interview Paul, since Paul had all these opinions about the Jews and the Jewish law and the way the Jews ought to worship and whether Jesus of Nazareth was the Jewish Messiah. Maybe he thought this discussion would entertain his wife, that she would find it interesting. His wife's name is Drusilla. So he sends for Paul and he, he listens to Paul speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 25, when Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, the judge got scared. Think about that. The Roman officer who was the judge, he's the one who becomes frightened. The prisoner is not frightened. The judge is frightened. The exact same thing happened between Jesus and Pilate. When the Jews told Pilate that Jesus had claimed to be the Son of God, Pilate already knew that there was something, there was something different about Jesus. He became scared and he ran to Jesus and he said, who are you? So the, the, the first thing that Felix does wrong is he procrastinates. He puts off doing the right thing. Then he breaks his promise. He doesn't bring the commander in there to decide the case. Then the third thing he does wrong is he, he does the wrong thing with his conviction. What's conviction? Conviction is the realization that we've done something wrong and we need to do something about it. Conviction is the realization that we've either believed the wrong thing or we've done the wrong thing. Now, Paul talked about three things. He talked about righteousness. There is a standard of right and wrong. It is a discoverable standard. It is a standard we can know about, we can learn about. This was probably a new thought for Felix, but he's got a conscience and he knows that, he's, that it's true. Then he talks about self-control. That means we have an obligation to live up to that standard of righteousness. Paul talks about this same thing in Romans chapter 1. So there is right and wrong, there's an objective standard of right and wrong. There's not right and wrong for one person is different than right and wrong for another person. There is an objective standard of righteousness which exists outside of us. It is not produced by us. It exists objectively above us and outside of us. Secondly, self-control. We have a responsibility to arrange our lives in such a way that we conform to that standard of righteousness. In other words, we don't do what we want to do. We are not a law to ourselves. We do not create our own morality. We are obligated to conform our lives to that external objective standard of righteousness. And thirdly, one day we're going to be judged on whether we did it or not. 
and how well we did it. Now, Paul presents that message in the presence of the Roman governor and his wife, and the Roman governor gets scared. He comes under conviction. Now, he does the wrong thing with conviction, with his conviction. I told you before that the gospel wounds. It wounds us. But the gospel also heals us. I told you before that the gospel stings. But the gospel also sings. And he is wounded by the gospel. He realizes that he doesn't hold to any standard of righteousness. He realizes that he didn't, he didn't have any self-control, that he doesn't try to conform his life to what's right and wrong. He does whatever he wants to do, as long as he can get away with it and he doesn't get punished by the authorities over him and power in Rome and the Roman hierarchy. And now he's being told by Paul that he's going to be judged for this. He sits in the seat of judgment, but one day he's going to be judged by a perfect judge. And he gets scared. But what does he do with his fear? He runs away. He's wounded, but he doesn't go to the doctor. He tries to deal with his wounds all his own. He's poisoned by sin, but he doesn't take the antidote, which is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. He runs away. He's scared. So he does the wrong thing with his conviction. Conviction is when our conscience is awakened. We realize that there's right and wrong, and we realize that we're on the wrong side, that we've done wrong, and it has to be dealt with. What are we going to do? He says in verse 22, go away, go away. This is too much. I can't talk about this anymore. I'll tell you. Don't call, we have a saying in English, don't call me, I'll call you. And what that really means is, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. That's what Felix says. He says, when I find time, I'll call you back. I will summon, summon you. Well, there's a, there's, actually there are five things he does wrong. There's a fourth thing. He wanted a bribe. He wanted Paul to give him money. Now, you know, I actually make a distinction about this morally. Um, I, don't, you probably, I hope you know what the Russian words are, but there are two words in English. There's the word bribe and there's the word extortion. A bribe is when you pay somebody something to do the wrong thing. That's a bribe. And that's a sin. Extortion is when someone makes you pay for them to do the right thing. That's extortion. Now, I'll tell you, I've never given anybody a bribe, but more than once I've been a victim of extortion. You know, so when you travel and when you do what I do, and you come to borders and you come to, sometimes people won't give you what they're supposed to give you unless you give them money but they're supposed to give it to you. They're just refusing to do the right thing. If you pay somebody to do the wrong thing, that's a bribe, that's illegal. But if somebody makes you pay them to do the right thing, you're not sinning, they're sinning. It's extortion. Well, Felix wanted money, but Paul, neither Paul nor his friends gave him the money. Now look at this, after two years, He left him in prison for two years in Caesarea. Two years because he refused to do the right thing. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. 
And another governor came along and succeeded Felix. His name was Festus, Portius Festus. And because he didn't want to offend the Jews and because he, he wanted to do the Jews a favor, Felix just left Paul in prison until the, his term of his office is over. He, he broke his promise to Paul. He did not decide the case by bringing the commander down from Jerusalem to Caesarea. He leaves him in prison until he leaves office. And so the new ruler uh, arrives. And um, then Paul makes his case before the new ruler because um, the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews are not satisfied that Paul is just in prison. They want to bring him to Jerusalem so they can kill him along the way. Maybe these men are still fasting two years later. I don't know. But Festus said that they were going to leave him in Caesarea and uh, they'll try him there. And so sure enough, in verse 7, the, uh, the Jews come down and they have their trial of Paul. And Festus, like Felix, also wanted to do the Jews a favor. And he asked Paul if he wanted to go to Jerusalem to be tried. Now something very important happens in Paul's legal history at this time. He exercised his right as a Roman citizen not to be tried locally. He exercised his right as a Roman citizen to be tried by the highest authorities in Rome. And so he says in verse 11, I appeal to Caesar. And in verse 12, Caesar's representative said, You appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.